Sweet. You got your Bibles? Go with me to Mark chapter 15, okay? This morning, we're, we're in Mark 15. We're in the account of Jesus' death on the cross. And as we're going to see here, like Mark just packs a punch. Like every verse is loaded with information. And maybe just as a precursor to this, I was thinking about how good information is, right? It's like facts, details, insider knowledge that Mark is getting from Peter. It's all very good. But what we don't want to have happen this morning is that we would just look at the account of the cross as information, facts, details, knowledge, because the Bible tells us that the cross is the power to save. Uh, Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. And so let's pray this morning as we get into God's word. Father, we just, we just want to give you this time. We pray that as we look at, in a lot of ways, a hard text on the death of Jesus and his crucifixion, Lord, that as we as we dig in here, that this would not just be information, Lord, but that there would be a transformation in each one of our hearts and lives. I ask, Lord, that there would be a demonstration of your Spirit's power to make the Word of God come alive to our hearts and to our minds. And so we give you this time. We thank you for this text of Scripture. We thank you that the written Word leads us to Christ, who is the living Word. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, just before we get started, Blake, I think we should just kill the, the lights. Sorry, I'm going to stand in the dark, but we got one here that's just being. Yeah, there we go. Is that better? Am I in the dark? Okay. Right on. Okay, sweet. Okay, well, we're going to jump in here in chapter 15 of Mark in verse 21. Uh after a sleepless night for Jesus of his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane, the murderous desires of, of men um, who had come up with a false conviction on Jesus. He had been beaten, as we saw last week. He had been flogged. He was led out um, to be crucified by the Roman soldiers. There was a battalion, 600 soldiers, remember that, involved in this battalion, and it may have seemed like a defeat, but it was for this reason that he came. And I hope we're going to see that this morning. And so it says this in verse 21. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. So this man, <laughs> here's Jesus being marched towards Golgotha, and at the same time, Golgotha, you know, they believe is right at a major intersection. I totally think that when you visit the city of Jerusalem, you get that sense that this was a very uh, busy intersection where Jesus was crucified. And while they're making their way there, what do they come across? They come across a man who has traveled a great distance from the country who is coming into Jerusalem for Passover celebration. Remember, the city of Jerusalem had about 60,000 residents. And at Passover time, the city would swell to a million people. And Simon had come from Cyrene. That's North Africa. He traveled well over a thousand kilometers on his journey to come and celebrate Passover. He was the father of Alexander and Rufus. I, I wonder, the text doesn't tell us, but I wonder if his family had traveled with him on this journey and Simon, a man coming all this way, the first thing that he was likely on his way to do as he arrives in Jerusalem is to make his way to the temple. Maybe even to begin his time there with a sacrifice. And that's where Simon came into contact with Jesus, the Lamb of God who was about to take away the sins of the world. The Romans, in their practices, they required that those who were condemned to die by crucifixion carry their own cross. And so it wouldn't be whatever picture you have in your mind, it wouldn't be the entire cross shape that we classically think of. You know, the cross beam and the vertical hunk, 
chunk of wood that it would have been nailed to. It would have just been the cross beam that Jesus was carrying. And if you think about him, after a night of false witnesses and kangaroo hearings and enduring more punishment than I'd prefer to imagine or really talk about in a lot of ways, including a Roman flogging, he was forced to carry the cross to Golgotha. And we find out that it's more than he could physically do at this point in time with all that he'd endured. And it's interesting because Jesus taught this. The master had taught, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross daily, and follow me. And Simon of Cyrene is about to learn this lesson. Learn what that meant. And Simon, it's, he's, when we get to eternity, I'm looking forward to meeting this man, aren't you? He had a providential meeting on the road to Golgotha. A lesson on the cost of discipleship. This man who was the father of Alexander and Rufus. And I imagine it was a very chaotic scene. Like you've got 600 soldiers just in the battalion. Let alone whatever else is happening on the streets. And in the midst of it, Simus, Simon is grabbed out of the crowd. And ends up having an encounter with the Lord Jesus. Don't you imagine that at some point they locked eyes? And as he's forced to carry the cross, maybe he's locked arms with Jesus, locked eyes with him and had an incredible, unexplainable peace come over his heart and mind, a peace that surpasses understanding. I mean, think about this man. When all was said and done, he probably had to clean the blood of Jesus off his skin and off his clothes. And maybe after that encounter, he thought, I never want to scrub my skin ever. In Paul's greeting, at the end of his book of Romans, as he's reaching out to the Roman church and greeting them, it's interesting. It says this in Romans chapter 16, verse 13. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Rufus. Scholars think this is the son, Rufus, the son of Simon of Cyrene. He had two boys, Rufus and Alexander. And here, you know, I don't know if it's the, the same Rufus, but a lot of scholars tend to believe it is. And I just think, yeah, that sounds like a Bible story right there. And Rufus, Paul said to him, Rufus, you're chosen in the Lord. Isn't that a great statement about someone? To be able to say that over someone's life. You're chosen in the Lord. How could he say that? Well, this is the boy whose father was pulled out of the crowd to carry the cross of Jesus. In God's sovereign power, in his providence, Rufus was chosen uh, to serve the Lord and he was a member of the church in Rome many decades later. And so Mark tells us that Simon carrying this cross along with Jesus was led to the place of the skull called God called Golgotha. And it says in verse 23, and they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Now the, the wine mixed with myrrh, that's a bit of a, a homebrew narcotic that was offered to numb pain, to deaden pain. In this case, to deaden the pain of someone who was about to have their hands and feet Nailed to the cross. And I have to tell you, if I was ever in any sort of position like that myself, God forbid, I'd be taking the wine and myrrh. Wouldn't you? Anyone else would take that offer. And Jesus did not. And I love this picture of him. He wasn't looking for an easy path. He was fulfilling his purpose. He was fulfilling foretold prophecy with a mind clear, sober, with perfect vision, he submitted to the Father, taking the wrath of God upon himself to redeem men in their sin. He was literally fulfilling Psalm 69, written by David, which says this in verse 19. You know my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. My foes are all known to you. Reproaches have broken my heart so that I am in despair. I look for pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but found, I found none. 
They gave me poison for food and for my thirst. They gave me sour wine to drink. With regard to this poison, we're clearly told that Jesus refused to drink. He would face the cross and face the wrath of God, bearing my sin, bearing yours, fully conscious, fully aware of what he was doing and what men would do to him. And then it says in verse 24, And they crucified him, and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. The Romans um, won't spend a lot of time talking about crucifixion and the practices of crucifixion this morning. But we do know this. They nailed him to the tree. They lifted him up. The Romans would do this. You know, whatever you would picture in your mind, eye, they'd just lift a man just off the ground. Not way up high. Just off the ground because he served as a warning to the entire community. They wanted everyone who walked down the road near Golgotha to be able to look in the eyes of a person who was nailed to the cross. They were low enough to the ground that a dog could lick the victim's blood. And the location of Golgotha was an intersection of roads, like I mentioned, just outside the city. So there's, there's many thousands of people passing by. And Mark points out this fact that the soldiers divided his garments among them by casting lots. Again, this is a fulfillment of scripture, of prophecy that's more than a thousand, about a thousand years old at this point in time. A fulfillment of Psalm 22, which also prophesied the brutal reality of being nailed to a cross and prophesied the results of Christ's flogging that would be so horrific that his flesh would be so torn that bones would be exposed. It says this in Psalm 22. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. And the psalmist presents this picture. And the gospels recounts it to us that Christ suffered shame and reproach of men. They divided his clothing and cast lots for it. And then Mark and all this just information, information, information tells us the exact time of day this happened. Look at verse 25. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. The third hour by Jewish count is 9 a.m. in the morning. By, by the Jewish accounting of the day, the clock began at sunrise at 6 a.m., and you think about all that Jesus has endured from the night before celebrating Passover and the Last Supper with the Twelve, making his way to the Garden of Gethsemane and spending the evening in prayer, his arrest and trial, and all that had happened from the house of Caiaphas and Annas to the courts of Pilate. Everything had moved very quickly and it's shocking. He's on the cross nailed there by nine in the morning. Verse 26 says, and the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. Whether they realize it or not, the Romans were mocking and the Jews opposed the posted charge, king of the Jews, but it was true. <laughs> he was the king of Jews, the Jews, but it's also an insufficient statement about Jesus, isn't it? They could have written down, king of kings, lord of lords. He really was the king of the Jews despite their protests. But in all reality, he was more than that. King of the universe. All things seen and unseen. The authority and power to which they belong. And Mark also tells us in verse 27, who they crucified with him. Look at verse 27. And with him, with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. Makes me think of James and John. Remember those two? With their mother's help, they came to Jesus to lobby him for positions at his right hand and left when he entered his kingdom. He said to them, you don't know what you're asking for. Are you able to endure what I will endure? He said, yes, Lord, we will. And he said, you're right, actually. You will endure very much for my name. 
but the place at my right hand and left is already reserved. Two robbers, two thieves with Jesus in between them. That's where human beings place Jesus. With others condemned to die. Three of them hung there. Two guilty of their crimes, one innocent, one offering himself as a substitute for the crime of those on his right and left and for everyone else. Isaiah prophesied this. He was numbered with transgressors. Isaiah 53, 12. And it seems like as you work your way through Mark's gospel that practically every detail was foretold by the prophets. Isn't that amazing? Whether you read the words of the prophets or, or the account of Mark, the reality that is presented to us over and over is that the cross and this experience for Jesus was incredibly painful, incredibly shameful in the eyes of men, and yet it was incredibly, and yet though it was incredibly painful and incredibly shameful, it was entirely foretold and part of God's purpose in his sovereign plans. And I love this. This is very important when it comes to the cross that we not forget this or fail to realize this, that Christ Jesus was not actually victimized by men, church. Men were fulfilling the foreordained plans of God for their own redemption. It's as though in the sovereignty of God, you might say these plans were formed before the foundation of the earth was laid, like the word of God tells us foretold by the prophets and fulfilled in detail by Jesus. So we can say this about Christ. He was not a victim. As much as your heart feels sorry for him and mind feels sorrowful as you go through the account of the cross, Jesus was not a victim, church. He was not a victim. He was offering himself as a sacrifice. And in that crowd... And at that moment, these things were happening to him and no one could see what was happening. No one there who observed realized what was going on. No one could comprehend the reality of the cross and what Jesus was doing. No one in the moment understood the divine act, the divine exchange of sacrificial atonement. Christ Jesus offering himself in their place, in my place, in your place. The reality of fulfilled prophecy, they're blind to it. The fact that he was not victimized, but entirely in control, they couldn't see it. They had eyes, but they could see. They had hearts that could not comprehend. And this morning, I would just ask us, as we go through the gospel account, can you see it? Can you see what Jesus is doing for you? Do you see what he's doing for the world? Do you see it? Can you comprehend it? Has the Holy Spirit revealed it to your heart? If he hasn't, I pray that he will this morning. What Christ was doing on that cross. Does your heart know? This is the Lamb of God taking away the sins of the world. As awful as it is, it is the greatest victory in the history of the universe. The Lamb of God offering himself obediently obedient to the will of his father. He's no victim. Don't feel sorry for him. Don't feel sorry for him. Feel the reality of sin and the cost of redemption and bow the knee to Jesus. Amen. Verse 29, it says this, and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself and come down from that cross. Rejected. <laughs> Despised by men. People were passing by. It's a busy road. It's almost like Mark just paints a picture of the scene for us. Everyone knew about the Nazarene. Everyone. Everyone knew about the prophet from Galilee. And these passerbys didn't draw, by, uh, didn't draw near and look him in the eye. They just passed by. <laughs> To me, as Mark says that, it's like a warning. Don't just pass by. Don't walk by. Don't wag your head and deride at Jesus. I don't want to pass by. Don't pass by. They kept their distance. Let me say this. 
Don't keep your distance from Jesus. Don't just pass by. Hear the call of the Holy Spirit from the word of God. They wag their heads. Their mouth spoke out of the hardness of their heart. They ridiculed and they scoffed and they played out the part of the wicked as prophesied in Psalm 22 by King David. Psalm 22 verse 7 and 8 says this. All who see me mock me and those and they make mouths at me. They wag their heads. <laughs> Exactly what Mark said. They wagged their heads at him. Verse 8 says, He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him. For he delights in him. And so here's this crowd. They, they mock the Son of God. He trusts in the Lord. Let God deliver him. Let God deliver him. If the Father delights in him, let him deliver him. You know, I was thinking about that. It's, it's true. He is his Father's. He is the one and only son. This is the one of whom the father said, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. The father did delight in him. The father did delight in him. The father could say of his son, he pleases me. He brings me joy. He is my delight. Jesus said of his father, I don't do anything unless it's his will. He exists to the delight of the Father, and the Father delights in His Son, and He desired to please His Father, and so He stayed right there on the cross. Verse 31 says, So also the chief priests and the scribes mocked Him, saying to one another, saying, He saved others, He cannot save Himself. It's just like arrogant, prideful, Human hearts are always full of irony, aren't they? Like it's just irony. And God have mercy. God have mercy. I just think, wretched man that I am, who will save me? And thanks be to Jesus, our Savior. They mocked him for not saving himself. Blind to the reality that he's actually there to save them. They failed to comprehend. If he saved himself, there's salvation for no one. He wasn't nailed there for himself. He was nailed there entirely for others. He wasn't thinking about himself. In fact, that's what we learn in the other gospels. He said to the, said to the father in his prayer, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He delighted in the father. He wanted nothing but the father's will and to fulfill his purposes and plans. In fact, he said this, here I am, I, I have come and I desire to do your will. Verse 32, they scoff and they say, let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. You know, I have to say this morning, as I think about this text, I'm really thankful, grateful to the Lord. Grateful to the Lord that though men derided him, I'm so thankful he didn't come down. Thank you, Jesus, for not coming down off the cross. If he came down, you and I'd be lost forever. But he didn't come down. And for that, we praise him and we thank him. Verse 33 says this, when the sixth hour had come, so three hours has passed. When the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. So for, for three hours, the first three hours on the cross, there's daylight. And for the next three hours on the cross, darkness comes over the land from noon to 3 p.m. Which is, as you know, the middle of the day. Obviously not normal unexplainable, indescribable darkness. I imagine it was like the kind of darkness that could be felt, like when darkness came over the land of Egypt during the plagues. Should have been the brightest part of the day. And that's not some random event. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Amos, chapter 8.
That's always a tough spot to find. <laughs> so Hosea, after Daniel. Joel, and then Amos. And it says this in chapter 8 of Amos, verse 9 and 10. I'm having you turn there on purpose because I think these are great verses. It says this. And on that day, declares the Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning and your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth cloth on every waist and baldness on every hand. And I will make it like the morning for an only son. And the end of it will be a bitter day. The darkness was a sign of God's judgment. And it was also a sign of his mourning for his one and only son. His grief for his son. And then Mark tells us in verse 34, chapter 15, at the ninth hour, so that's three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As we say, the father turned his face away. And the anguish of this cry is one that's so full of agony. Though, though Jesus is on the cross and suffering physically, this is not a cry of physical agony and physical pain, but such an agony in this cry that is to the Father that it, that it would truly break a heart. Break a heart. This is a heart cry. This is the cry of a heart and heartache and heartbreak. And as we know... <laughs> Maybe you don't know this, but Jesus did not die from his wounds. And Jesus did not die from nails. When the soldier pierced his side, what came from his side? Blood and water. Medically, his heart gave out. He died of a broken heart. It broke. His heart separated into pieces. The muscle, the four chambers broke. Not from shock, not from strain. The scripture says he gave up the ghost because his father forsook him. The father forsook. Forsaken. Forsaken so that you and I wouldn't be. He offered himself for you. He was forsaken so that you wouldn't be. And he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's like the cry of the condemned. It's the heart cry of the deepest, possible, most unimaginable pain. Harmony broken between the Father and the Son. Rift, for those who were at 2-7 with us yesterday, or at our DTS yesterday. There was now a rift between the Father and the Son. A chasm. The Son and the Father divided, broken, God on one side of the chasm and the son on the other side. Though he was sinless. He joined sinful men and was separated from God. Separated from a holy, perfect, loving father bearing the sin of mankind. And I have to say, I honestly think that the universe has never heard a more painful cry than that one. My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? And he was forsaken so that you and I wouldn't be. This is very fascinating. Look at the response to this cry by the people. Verse 35. And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he's calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait. Let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. I'm like, isn't this crazy? You're like, what is going on here that this is their response to this heartbroken cry of the Lord Jesus? They said, quick, someone get him a drink. Get him a drink. And the, the crowd that scoffed and, and had mocked and had 
wagged their heads at the cry of his agony, hearing his agony of separation from the Father recognized something, they expected that something supernatural was about to happen. They actually expected something supernatural was happening. They said, let's see if Elijah shows up. I'm like, what? That's crazy. Let's see if Elijah shows up and takes him down off the cross. They recognized this crowd in this moment that something so powerful was happening, they expected chariots of fire. They questioned whether Elijah, who had been caught up in a rapture, caught up in a whirlwind to heaven with chariots of fire, would appear and take Jesus down up off, off the cross. They wondered if he who had been raptured would return in that moment. These are some pretty crazy expectations, don't you think? Kindled. Kindled by the forsaken cry of Christ in his agony. The cry was so powerful they were expecting the trump of God to sound. But they were wrong. It wasn't the trump of God. It was the agony of separation. The broken hearted cry of the forsaken son of God. And while they waited for Elijah to appear. Jesus uttered another loud cry. This cry different from the previous cry. The earlier cry was the cry of the forsaken, but this cry? This cry was the cry of victory that shook the bowels of Hades. The cry that changed everything. The cry of victory. You know, as Christ hung on the cross and had given the forsaken cry, all the universe had hung its head in, in defeat or in victory in some sort of way. The angels mourned. The demons cheered. The enemies of King Jesus rejoiced. Every spirit, every angel, every demon, every person, every being in the unseen realm and the seen realm saw Christ Jesus as defeated. So you know what he did? He sounded the cry of victory on the cross. The shout of the victor. And as the demons jeered and the angels mourned and all the universe was observing, they wondered, why is he shouting in victory? Why is he shouting? They questioned, seen and unseen. Doesn't he know? He's defeated. But church, he cried victory. And the foundations of the deep shook. It is finished. It is done. Look at what it says in verse 37. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last breath. That is the shout of the victor. King Jesus. Victory. He breathed his last. And though in the moment it seems like all is over. And the demons are jeering. And the angels are grieving. Christ declared his victory in that shout. And he breathed out his last breath. And as I read that verse I think. Christ Jesus, breath of God, breathe on me. Breathe on me. Would you stand with me this morning? Let's pray. I'm going to invite the worship team to come. Lord, as we consider this text of Scripture, your word that you shared with us from Mark, we thank you, Jesus, that though forsaken, you declared yourself victorious. And Jesus, this morning, we're looking unto you. We thank you, Lord, for the shout of victory. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that the cross is not a defeat. The cross is a win. And Lord, for that, we praise you. We thank you, Jesus, that on that cross, you bore our sin in your body on that tree that you might redeem us. And so, Lord, this morning, we are looking to you as victor, as savior, as our Lord and master. And we pray that you'd breathe on us, Jesus. We pray, Jesus, that we would truly comprehend in a fresh way this morning the power of your saving work. And Lord, we come to you. 
And we ask you, forgive us our sins. Purify our hearts. Lord, wash us clean in your blood. Jesus, we confess you are Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Would you rule in our hearts and in our lives and in our church? And this morning, we thank you for the cross, Jesus, and for your victory. I pray, Jesus, that every set of ears in this place would hear the shout of Christ's victory from the cross this morning. And that it would ring in their ears for all eternity. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.